Have been enjoyable to be on tour together? So far? Uh, you've toured together before. Uh, 84, right. Back in 84, I think. Uh, you must be uh, pretty excited about coming back together again. How's it going? It's going great. The response was great last night. People were, you know, they're, they're the hallelujah, you know, when the, the Holy Ghost shows up and people rejoice. And I'm very grateful. It's a great, it's a great uh, way to serve the people. Let's talk about uh, current music. Um, is there any current music that you listen to that you think really like? Uh, current music. Let's see. What would that be? Uh, I really like a lot of it sounds defective to me. It's, it makes me restless. I listen to a lot of music from African people from Paris, uh, which is, uh, and it's really, uh, it's really fresh. It's, to me, I think it's the music of tomorrow. You know, the, the, the music of the streets is, the music of the future is coming out of the streets, and particularly from Paris because of the ghettos and the African people. That's, it sounds newer than Prince or Michael Jackson to me, you know, it's, their, their music is, is so uh, rooted that it's the future, actually, you know, because it's so, it's so ancient that if you just take four bars, you can just start a new, the, the future. Let's talk a little bit about some of the current music you've heard. Do you feel, do you hear any of the, your own influences in some of the current music? Oh, well, I heard this group this summer called uh, Manic Street Preachers, which Sounded pretty good to me. What's that? Some of the current music. Do you hear any of your own influences and some of the current stuff out today? Yeah, I, you know, we learn so much from so many people that it's bound to happen that people are going to learn from us. You know, uh, when I, I was on the road last uh, month in Europe, I, I heard a couple of bands that it's kind of like compliment. They sound like they're presenting their stuff sort of the way we do it, you know. Um, but uh, so it's a compliment, you know. Yeah, we saw you at the backstage in Seattle watching the Wallflowers, um, and I know you have a nephew in a group. Uh, do you think it's tougher for relatives of famous people to get in because of, uh, you know, they may get a door in, but at the same time they may be compared to their famous relatives? Do you feel it's tougher or easier? Well, it's tougher, uh, you know, in one way. And to break through today is uh, it's difficult. It's more possible to have the original sound today than it was a few years back. You know. Depends on who you are. You know, if you have enthusiasm and you have imagination, Rolling Stone and Magazine, they're going to have to come. Rolling Stone and MTV, they'll have to come to you, just like they did for Metallica and uh, the, the bands from here in Seattle. You know, uh, people didn't pay attention to them until they had to. So I think that it doesn't matter who, who your father is. If you have an intense uh, enthusiasm and, and ambition of what you're doing, he'll come to you. So that people shouldn't be uh, intimidated by what their parents do, I don't think. You're born, our children are born to transcend this anyway. So. How do you feel about the Wallflowers music? Do you feel it's That's developing? That's good. It sounds good to me. Uh -huh. It's going up. This is for Carlos. Um, tell us something about your record label, Cuts and Grace. Uh, what did you decide to put together and what kind of music will you be presenting? Around 88, music from the heart for the heart. And uh, the first project that we're doing is the last the last live performances of uh, Marvin Gaye, Jimi Hendrix, Mar Bob Marley, John Coltrane, and Stevie Ray Vaughan. And uh, it's called Live Forever, and it should be coming out next uh, in October, actually. Tell us about the upcoming benefit concert for recognition of Native American. Well, we're still working on it. Uh, it'll probably be in Tucson now instead of New York City. And it's, oh, our main object, objective is to put the American Indians in the United Nations so they will be recognized as a nation. They, they, they will be allowed, hopefully they will be allowed to vote as people and be recognized as people instead of savages or animals, which is how they've been treating them to this day. So we just want to put attention to them so they can be able to make decisions uh, that concern all of us. For me, they're the first gardeners. I mean, the Japanese are intense gardeners, but they're not as intense as the, as the American Indians because they, they, they can grab the earth, smell it, and they don't need uh, the weather report to tell them whether it's going to rain or not. They're more connected than we are. So that's what we're trying to do is so they can 
uh, help our children's children with, with the... Uh, they want three things. The American Indians only want three things. Clean air, clean water, clean consciousness. They don't want MTVs or they don't want BMWs or they don't want, you know, they're not fighting for that. They want clean air, clean water, clean consciousness. So I have to, my, my heart has to go with them. This is directed to Bob. Uh, you've given permission to have Michael Rolling Stone sampled for the first time. Uh, how did that ever come about? Who did that? A group called Mystery Tramps. Oh. Hip hop version. Really? Okay, yeah. It's me. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, Bill Cutler, the uh, producer of that, said that you being the first street poet were sort of the first rapper. How do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm the first somebody, you know. Um, in the context of that, um, do you see a relationship between politically aware rap and some of the stuff you were doing years ago? Well, maybe there's some correlation, but whatever it is, it wouldn't be convenient for me to say that. I mean, I'm going to ask you a question about, uh, it seemed kind of ironic that Sinead O'Connor was booed off a concert. Um, you know, it seemed like, it seemed ironic because they're honoring somebody who pioneered protest music and they seem to be booing her for protesting and what do you say about that? You know, she had grown up. I mean, people do what they want to do, every day what they want to do, you know. Uh, shouldn't really take it as an insult, though, you know. Um, uh, Elvis even got booed, you know, so that is no big deal. Uh, in the current issue of Rolling Stone, one of the writers criticized a uh, $65 top of tickets and called it whopping and obscene and all of that stuff. He said you should suck on soap and... How do, you, how do you respond to somebody write something like that? No kind of way. What, he never get up there and sing anything. You know. Connoisseurs, you know, they're, they're all, all over the place. But, uh, you know, it's different when you get up there and you're doing it. Anybody can be talking about it. Uh, How's that for a response? <laughs> uh, this is for a thing we're doing on violence. I'm going to ask some general questions. Um, do you think teen violence is a uh, big problem in today's society? Television causes not that violence. That's my opinion. But people see it on TV and they want to do it. That's just my opinion. Whatever people see, uh, TV in my mind forms people's opinions. Y'all know that anyway. Yeah, so they should show uh, 24 hours of Jesse Owens or uh, Arthur Ashe or Bob Dylan or. You know, just, uh, people who spend so much money in corporations, they should spend half of that into showing the excellence of humanity. You know, Billie Jean King made tennis what it is. If you show Billie Jean King winning some of the Wimbledons, you know, if, if they spend some of the time and energy in, uh, showing excellence and dignity that we have as human beings, people will also emulate that. You know, and it's also profitable because people will... You can see so much bad news on, on whatever network that you see that when you do get around to seeing good news, people will suck it up. People will eat it up, you know, because it's different than what they see 24 hours a day. My philosophy is, is that, uh, yeah, the gangs in, in L.A. or whatever, if they if they start showing Jim, Jim Brown or or whoever, you know, uh, color don't matter or sports or musician, just show excellence and dignity from humanity. And then the young people will say, well, I can do that. And then, then somebody else will say, well, let me see you do it. And then they, that'll set you, you know, I read before that Bob one, once heard Little Richard, you know, and that turned him on to getting into music also. So we all have things that pushes you into finding your own destiny, your own so-called place in the sun. Yeah, the TV can play a, a very positive role into uh, the ungenocide things that are happening within certain parts of town. Do you think the availability of guns is a big problem today? I don't think there's enough guns. What about guns among kids? Do you think it's just too prevalent? Toy guns. They're more toy guns than real guns, really. Where do you think, where do you think kids get these guns? They get them in a toy store. Now, what, makes, what do you think makes a young person carry a gun? Protection. Uh, to me, the main thing is the, the, 
they have this excuse that, you know, you need a gun to protect yourself, even from the government. You know, who are you kidding, man? When the government wants to come in, like what they did at Watts, you know, or whatever, uh, the last riots with Rodney Holmes, or uh, Rodney King, uh, you know, the, the, when, they, when, they, when they call the army, whatever you got, it's not going to do anything. So, to me, it's an excuse that you got to carry a gun to protect yourself from the... In, in Japan, in England, they don't have guns, and they don't have so much killings. Uh, of gangs, so so I, you know, I think that the government wants the government has wants to have it both ways. Is really what it is. They want to be able. In fact, if you don't if you don't make any bullets anymore, you can have as many guns as you want. Just don't make any bullets. You know what I mean? So there's a solution to it, but it's more profitable. It's like people don't put a stop sign on the street until somebody's kid dies. Three or four of them. You know, so that's how we we have to put the pressure on the government because they're the ones that they pay by us a lot of money you know, for them to make decisions that benefits your children and my children's children. And to, as far as I'm concerned, they're just jiving, you know, because they know what's happening. One more question. Um, your, your new album is basically an acoustic album. I heard it was done mostly in one takes. Um, what, what led you to do that? Is the the unplugged um, trend? And well, it was just easy for me to do that, make an album by myself. You know, I, if, uh, anybody would do it if they could, really. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Mick Jagger, if he could go to the studio and record an album all by himself, you know, he'd be probably the first one to do it. Uh. All right, fine, you count it in. I'll count it in. <laughs> uh, two. One, two, three.